All right, guys, so uh, welcome. Chris A. Vance with Wi-Fi Training, and we are going to configure a new Cisco 9K switch for wired secured access in this video with ICE 3.3 uh, for all of the wired devices in our topology. So this video we might post on YouTube. I'm not sure yet. That's why I'm introducing myself in Wi-Fi Training.com. But this is the topology we are working with uh, for this particular switch right here. Now, all we have is ICE 3.3 barely stood up and we've connected Active Directory to that identity services engine with some of the courses we're doing with Wi-Fi training. And now we're, we're, I'm really doing a wireless course, to be honest, with 9800s, but I wanted to show everybody the wired configurations because our APs may want to authenticate, endpoints may want to authenticate, and bottom line is it's just good practice to have everything wired and wireless to know who it is that's connecting to the network and making sure that every device connects to the network. We are only as good as our weakest link, as they say. So I still have this default policy in ICE. Again, the only thing I've really done is connected AD. And what I've done is at the, at the bottom of my default policy set, this default role here, I've switched from a deny to a permit. And that's because uh, every MAC address is gonna be brand new uh, and be learned by ICE the first time. And like I said, the only other thing we've done is we have joined uh, Active Directory as an external identity source. So if you look over here under external identity sources, you will see that Active Directory is there in our lab environment. So uh, again, we are going to connect this switch here uh, to ICE. And we also, one other thing I did with ICE is I used the default device to basically put in the Radius Shared Secret and TACAC Shared Secret so that the device could uh, be known to ICE and present authentications, whether it's TACAX or whether it's RADIUS. Uh, but no RADIUS configuration has been done on the switch yet. We are taking it from the get-go and we can validate that real quick by doing a show run, AAA. You see that the only thing here is TACAX related. So there's some TACAX configurations, but there is nothing RADIUS related. There's the TACAX server, there's the TACAX group, and uh, source tack that's be like that's really it very very basic configuration so far uh for this switch now to uh expedite this this lesson because guys i do five day classes on wired secured access deployments it takes a while to get everything configured and running but what we're going to do is just use a template that i have built that's kind of a best practice template with a lot of different features so that we can discuss them and move quickly on getting them configured, okay? So first thing is, these configurations underneath the actual interfaces, once we get ready to secure wired access ports, can get quite large. And what we wanna do is move as much of those commands out of the interface level and into the global configuration or to a template as possible, because otherwise you might end up with a, a 20 or 30 line uh, port configuration. Doesn't sound bad on 24 port switch, but whenever you have, you know, 94 tens and you've got 1048, you know, port blades, you're talking about uh, 480 ports of times 30, 40 lines of code sometimes, or I don't want to say 40, but it could be 10 to 20 easily with all the dot and X and everything. So as much as we can move to a template uh, that is reused at runtime or that we can use globally, the better. So uh, some of the first things we can do is spanning tree and do port fast default. And what that does is, is it says, hey, on all interfaces, we're gonna turn on port fast, right? For any access interface, we're gonna turn on port fast. But the second command we wanna do is spanning tree BPDU guard. Default, okay? So that says, hey, if we do create a loop, to shut down the port, error disable the port. And I'm not gonna take the time to go through all the error disable recovery commands, but uh, you typically wanna have those being able to recover themselves after the loop is gone, all that kind of stuff, and just make sure your, your alerts and syslog set up. Uh, like I said, this is gonna go pretty quick through all there is around the new IBNS2 architecture. So the first thing we've got is to define the global radius server. And we're gonna do that with this configuration here which is basically saying I have a server name, here's the IP address, and the ports are 1812, 1813 is the standardized ports nowadays, it used to be 1645, 1646. ICE will listen to all of those ports by default, but it's best practice to use 1812, 1813. 
We have to define a key. Again, this was already configured on the ICE node as a default device. So any device with that key would uh, be trusted for sending authentications, okay? So the next thing we're gonna do is create a group real quick. So we're gonna do AAA group server radius ICE. And I'm just gonna call it ICE, uppercase, very easy. Server name, PSN1. Now, uh, I don't have multiple servers in this lab, but uh, typically you would define at least two different PSNs. The PSN is the policy service node um, persona that ICE runs in a distributed environment. And you typically wanna have more than one for redundancy. And in really large environments, you might have several PSNs behind load balancers at different you know, data centers. In which case you would define, you know, one VIP as one, uh, you know, PSN, and you'd define another VIP at another data center as another PSN, and load balance that way to get your authentications uh, to the correct, you know, services. All right, so we've only defined one because again, it's a lab. The other thing is we've got uh, a feature called change of authorization. So Radius, we typically do. Uh, access accept messages at layer two with radius. So based on the MAC address or uh, some type of credential via, e you know, extensible authentication protocol, basically. So either certificates, usernames, whatever, or a MAC address. And once we give that access accept message, radius access accept with the appropriate attribute variables, then um, we're, radius is out of the picture. But sometimes we need to give some people access for a period of time, let them complete things, and then elevate their permissions or adjust that access in the middle of that conversation. So the new standard that was developed for that was called change of authorization. It came in the game later on, and uh, it's defined under the dynamic author commands. Okay, so let's go back, copy the wrong thing here. And basically what we're doing is we're defining the same server and just saying, hey, he can do change of authorization as well. And that's going to be the same key. Okay. So if you want to do like web redirection, guest portals, or posture assessments, or any of those advanced services, any change of authorization to be able to do that. So we've defined a, a radius server, we've defined a radius server group, and we've defined change of authorization service. The next thing we need to do is have our global radius commands. And basically, I've got a bunch of different commands here, and I will make this template available to anybody who asks to support. Okay. Uh, just say you saw this on YouTube, ping us at team at wifi and uh, ask for it, and I'm happy to share or happy to talk about it. Okay. Uh, we definitely share configs with a lot of our all access uh, past students, and they get access to all of our videos and uh, supporting uh, configurations to be able to lab this out themselves. So we've got these global uh, radius VSAs basically that says, hey, we want to know about accounting changes, we want to know about authentication. And then we also want to include these attributes, right? So we want to include attributes. We want to make sure that we try our radius servers, uh, you know, every 15 seconds, and then we'll do three tries. We'll mark it dead after a minute. And then down here, we're also going to say, we're going to include the Mac format. We want it in the IETF uppercase format. Uh, we want to include the NAS port detail, uh, for example. And then this command is important. This sends critical dot one X commands back to your supplicant so that it knows if something has gone on with the .1x architecture, okay? A lot of people forget that command, but it is important. Again, happy to share the, we're not really, I put a load balancing command in there. That's just because I cut and pasted it because again, we don't have multiple nodes to load balance yet, but if we did, that would be useful for it. All right, and then finally, since we are doing wired access on a switch, we're gonna need some AAA commands that have to do with radius. So. Here is our commands for that. So we're doing AAA authentication dot one X uh, default group ice. And this is the new method. Okay. Of identifying accounting and everything. I'm going to paste this one more time. The CLI structure of commands have changed over the years, guys. And actually, why do I still have that old command in there? We'll take that one out. I'm so used to putting that in there, the dot one X default start group, and it's really a AAA accounting identity default start stop group ice. And all I'm doing is defining that group that we created earlier for authentication, okay, for authorization and for accounting. That's really it. We're also saying we want to send updates for accounting info uh, every so often, right? All right, so now that's the global radius settings. 
Okay, so basically I've defined radius servers. I've defined settings to say uh, what I want to do for .1x authentication on the switch. But we now live in a world where we do, uh, you know, service policies, class maps, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm talking about the IBNS v2.0 architecture from Cisco, which is the identity-based network system. For wired deployments, we're on version 2.0, where we use a very flexible syntax and reusable syntax that allows for pretty much any type of condition the port may be in. So if you go back old school and you deploy .1x, we had to do all these workarounds to get ports to work right. Like if we had Pixie Boot devices out there, or if we had weird devices that didn't just conform to the whole uh, norms with MAB and .1x, then we had to get in all these weird different conditions and protocols. Well, nowadays, uh, we can build, use the C3PL language and architecture, which uses class maps, policy maps, service policies, to define a policy of this is what I want the port to do in any number of conditions that it faces. If the AAA servers are up, I want it to do this. If it's authenticated and it's down, or if it's authenticated and we lose connectivity, I want it to do this. And if we lose connectivity to ICE, I want to make sure we've always got critical access. You have all these if then else conditions that apply. Now, before we get to that policy, um, the, some of those policy elements are based off of ACLs, right? So ACLs is a way to classify and mark traffic. We have a few default ACLs that we're going to throw on here. And again, these are prerequisites, guys, uh, because my class maps and service policies, you'll see in just a second, they're going to call on these ACLs. So if they're not there, it's not going to work, right? You have to look at these new architectures, guys, where we're doing so many things at the, at the authenticator level, which is the switch or the wireless LAN controller or the firewall, that... There's a lot of different things going on locally before it ever involves uh, ICE now in the architecture, which is a good thing because it makes it very flexible, very scalable, and, and takes off some of the load uh, from ICE, right? We used to have different nodes to just do like profiling, for example, um, with our ICE architecture. Nowadays, our switches can do very, very detailed profiling of the devices that are connected to it and then share that information with ICE via radius accounting update messages. So I've got my ACLs now loaded, and then you're gonna notice I'm gonna start defining my class maps and service maps and service templates, okay? So here's a couple that are using those ACLs, right? So if you look, I created a service template said critical data, and then that service template accesses the ACL critical data. I've got another um, service template critical voice, and that is gonna access the voice VLAN, for example, if, it needs to uh, access that, right? And again, these aren't in use as at the moment, but I have them there in case I need to have them, right? That's the whole point, is uh, to be able to have those resources if I need to. Now, you're gonna see these different class maps that we define here that have a lot of different conditions. So these are class maps and it says, hey, if the AAA server's down, I want you to do this. If the .1x supplicant is not responding, I want you to do this. It's a bunch of if then else conditions, these different scenarios, right? And we come back to critical data or critical voice, right? All right, and now once those templates are there, those class maps are there, I can create my new policy map, okay? Now, this new policy map, I'm gonna go ahead and hit return, it is kind of like an ACL in a lot of ways. It has a bunch of conditions that are ordered, and basically it says, hey, I want you to do this until something happens, right? So let me show it to you in this text file. It's easier to, to read. Actually, let me show you uh, from the run. So that's gonna look for the part in our running config that begins with policy, okay which is going to be this new .1x default we just wrote. So basically, if you look right here, policy map, type, control, subscriber, .1x default, it says event started, match all. So always do until failure, authenticate using .1x priority 10, authenticate using MAD priority 20. So we want to authenticate .1x first if we can, but we're authenticating MAB also, right? We would do either. And then... We've got another event here and it says, hey, authentication failure match first. Well, if we failed authentication, we want to terminate .1x and then we'll try to authenticate with MAP if we can. 
And then we've got an authenticated host due until failure, right? So AAA server's down and the host is unauthenticated. Then we're going to apply the surface templates for critical data, critical voice, which we created earlier. So you can kind of see, guys, take some time and go back through this. And you'll see how all of it correlates, right? It's just building blocks that end up creating this uh, policy map and subscriber policy is what we call it, okay? Now, this is what gets attached to the interface that is gonna authenticate endpoints to an access port or to a service template, which basically we'll call the template to the interface is really the way we should be doing it nowadays, right? So now that we've got that subscriber template, um, we can enable dot one X. Okay. So if you look, there's no sessions currently because we haven't really enabled anything on any ports yet. Right? So what we're going to do real quick is we're going to create a new interface template and I'm going to show you that configuration. Okay. So here's an interface template. We're going to call it dot one X. And let's do a show VLAN real quick. So we've got different VLANs on the switch, 50s data, okay? So what I'm gonna do is put this guy in VLAN 50. And basically, we've got a template that's being defined. It's just an object. It's not doing anything yet. But it says, put the port mode access, put them on access VLAN 50, enable .1x. Uh, we've got a timeout period there, and we've got a max reauth, three tries. Then we'll do math and we're given dot one X port control, automatic port control of this interface, right? We're going to send authentication periodically. We're going to re-authenticate the server every so often. And bottom line is we're applying that service uh, policy that we created earlier, the dot one X default, which has all those conditions. It seems like a lot guys and it is, but once you do it a few times, you know, everything's easy once you know how is one of my favorite sayings, right? So you probably noticed some notes for a couple other things I'm going to talk about here in just a second, but we're going to go ahead and put in that uh, template. Okay, and for some reason this has spaces and places that, spaces and places that they don't like. So give me one second here. Spaces and places. Crack myself up. All right. Let's try that paste again. All right. That's a much better paste. Okay. So now we've got this template, right? So now let's find an, an interface that's got something that we can authenticate. Okay. So I'm going to do show CDP neighbors. And I see I've got this access port on access point on port gig 106. So we're going to do interface gig 106 and we are going to do a source template dot 1x. Okay. So what that does is that applies all these commands at runtime. Okay. So now we've got one device that is actually doing authentication, okay? So we do show access session to see which devices are authenticating in our architecture. We've got one, and then we can do gig one zero details. And it says authentication failed, right? interface 106 details now right now we've only got the mac address right um and you can see that's from that ietf uppercase that we did earlier that's the format of it uh, we can send that to ice in different formats if we want to to keep it straight it just depends but right now we're doing mab we haven't really told it to do any authentications but you can see it's doing dot one x default okay so that port's authenticating but we don't have a lot of intelligence one thing that's critical, guys, with our uh, wired configurations is being able to understand the IP uh, address to MAC bindings, one thing. But then also, I want to know more about the device, right? I mean, with CDP and LLDP, we can discover a lot of things about our devices now. 
And that's kind of the point. Um, back in the day, we used to use uh, profiling sensors on ice, and we still do to some extent, but we used to use them even more. And we would have to do a special nodes just to send that profiling data to for DHP and you know SNMP and all that kind of good stuff. And depending on your architecture, you might still use some of that. But we have all these great new features where we can offload some of that responsibility to the local switch. And in our case, uh, we're gonna do that. So there's a role called device sensor role. And this is what that looks like. Again, we have a template for it here. So for CDP, LLDP, DHP sensor. And we're gonna go ahead and grab that. And we have to start by turning on LLDP so that it, the sensor will work. So we're gonna go ahead and just paste this in. And again, I've got to remove our spaces here. Sorry about this. Let's try that again. There we go. We are permitting uh, Mac moves with our access uh, architecture, and it does so by default. So some of the things have changed from IBM S1 to IBM S2. It's not important. I need to change that and just take that out of our uh, template here. Okay, we're not going to include that for now. All right, so the device sensor, if you want to see what that did, if we do uh, show device sensor data, Sorry, details. This is what's enabled right now. We've got CDP, LLDP, and DHP uh, that's enabled. So if we do the cache all, you see this is basically LLDP information and CDP information that the switch is collecting locally and will share with ICE about the devices that are authenticated. So if we go back up to our Phase gate 106, if we do our show command there. All right, so we've still got our device here. We've got our MAC address. Um, I, this will share information about the device sensor with ICE via radius accounting update messages. But the other thing I mentioned that we need to do is device tracking, which gives us the IP to MAC binding. So let's go ahead and do that now. We're gonna this is going to be one of the last things we paste before we test this out. So we've got a device tracking policy and, and the one I'm using right now, I'm disabling NDP and also DHPv6 because we're not doing IPv6 in our labs. So it's a very basic device tracking policy. I need to get rid of that. Something in the template is thrown in the bees. That's fine. All right. And you can apply device tracking. The only place you can't apply device tracking is underneath the interface template. It's got to be applied under the physical interface itself or under the VLAN configuration table. So if we do show VLAN, I'm going to go ahead and include it for these uh, data VLANs, basically the 10, 50, 60, 80, uh, 99, I guess. Everything we might put an endpoint on, I need to include. So we're going to do VLAN configuration. We're going to do 10, 50, 60, 80, 99, we'll do um, 100, uh, let's keep 100 off of it. That's a management interface. So we'll do that, then we're gonna do IP, uh, sorry, we'll do device tracking, attach policy, IPDT underscore policy was its name. All right, you can see right there where I'm getting that. 
So we're gonna turn that on, and now we've got IP to MAC bindings. So if you wanna see what that did, we do show device tracking data. And now you see we've got IP to MAC to port bindings. What does that do? If we do our show access session again, interface gig 106 detail, we should now have the IP address known to the switch, uh, to the port. Now, that's important if we're gonna do DACLs and things like that. IP device tracking is one of those things that segmentation starts breaking down if you don't have that enabled. It's been around for a few years now. The syntax to configure IP device tracking has changed. Uh, the good news is that if you have DNAC and you um, add devices through uh, DNAC, it adds device tracking and a few other things for you automatically. Okay, so you may already have that configured and you may not need to do it for your particular deployment. Now, the other cool thing we want to see is what about like getting some, some visibility about the endpoint itself, right? We saw the CDP stuff, but is there any other tool we could use? And there is, all of our 9K switches have a really cool feature called device classifier. And in device classifier, it's one command to turn it on, just device classifier, that's it. And what that's going to do is it's going to start profiling endpoints locally and build a local table of device endpoints. So if we do show device classifier all or attached, my bad, you can see that we've got uh, these Mac to IP or Mac to port, but then it gets further than that because look, we've got model device name, okay, type. We got a lot of details and this list will continue to build. Furthermore, if we do our show access session command, interface gig 106 detail, you're gonna notice now we can see device type and device name underneath the port and the authentication. So now we've got more to the story here, right? And you notice how all of a sudden it's, it's a successful authenticated, this port is up. If we do a ping, 10 to 1 to 50.104, we should be able to reach that port, right? Well, I don't have an interface on that uh, network, so I may not be able to reach it. Let's see. Uh, and brief. I don't have a VLAN 50 address here and I don't have a route to it. That's the problem. I can prove that, just so you guys know. This guy's the router. And we'll do AEX. Let's see here. It's always fun implementing security and then getting locked out. Okay. So if we do the uh, ping 10.150.104, you can see it can reach it just fine, right? So um, let's check out the uh, ICE side because we did see that we were successful in authenticating. And let's go to our uh, operations and live logs. And you can see the authentications here uh, as they've happened, right? So. Let's refresh this guy and look Look at this first one. You don't see any endpoint details, right? Uh, but on the second one you do, and you also didn't have the IP address of the device, right? Before you didn't have that in the database. That also matters if you look at your context visibility and endpoints. If you notice a lot of entries in here without IP addresses, that means your switches are not configured correctly, okay? You should have a lot of details about the, your devices in these databases. Now, I still don't have even the switches configured and set up in ICE. I'm using a default device. Typically, once I add the switches, I will add locations. You'll add software versions. You'll add deployment mode. There's a bunch of other things you will add that give more context to uh, you know, your endpoint tables, right? But this is context visibility is where I can go see all the endpoints connected to the enterprise, what they're doing, where they're from, and I should be able to see everything about them. And so this becomes a very powerful uh, you know, database for other security integrations, other security products. So 
we went through that configuration really quick, guys, but we did deploy wired access, um, you know, IBNS2. We did get that integrated with, with this switch. As you see, we were able to um, authenticate that uh, access point in this case. And if we had other devices on the switch to authenticate, we could authenticate those too. But right now it doesn't look like I do. And 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 our topology here on that switch too, we've only got the one AP. So that's that's pretty much what we're gonna get on that particular switch. But hopefully this was informative and you see that, hey, once I have a good template defined uh, and uh, you know, if I want to set up a monitor mode deployment with ICE, it's as simple as just changing that last line to permit. Now, once these MAC addresses are in this context visibility and they're in your database, guess what? You could come back to your policy sets uh, and you could turn that into a deny and those authentications would still work, okay? This is just a way we do sometimes, like if you're in monitor mode, is what we call it, where we just want everything to be successful while we're rolling out the technology. And then once we roll it out and we see everything's working as it's designed, then we'll start a lockdown phase, right? So, uh, but we're just, right now, we're just giving you some examples of how to do the initial deployment and get everything talking to each other. Anyway, if you want to know more, uh, hit that like button, the subscribe button, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to post this on YouTube. Come see us at wi training.com. Uh, we've got a lot of videos about ICE deployments, about uh, wireless deployments of all types, obviously being Wi-Fi training.com, kind of specialize in the wireless stuff and the security stuff. So that's the two big areas we play in. But we have a lot of training about a lot of different things as a learning partner. And you can access courses like these, uh, you know, many hour courses about different products, technologies, services, or architectures on demand at wifi training.com. So we hopefully we'll see you there. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We'll see you.